don't know how to clean the room by the time they're a teenager, they're not going to start doing it in college. I mean, you know, this is something your parents were supposed to do when before five, okay, is teach you how to behave. So I'm sort of, um, I think we should treat students like adults, and they will behave by, like adults. It's sort of great expectations if you expect the students to respond. I find they do respond, okay, uh, so far as that goes. And I don't know, have I mentioned this? My, I had a father who, um, who basically expected, uh, he was a perfectionist, and he expected perfection from his children. And uh, he figured if you're five years old, you're, you're an adult, and you should be able to take care of yourself. Uh, and so the joke around the family is when I was five years old, I used to fix Sunday morning breakfast for my family. I've always gotten up early, and I'd get up early, and I would fix, at five years old, I'd fix a full breakfast of hot cereal and bacon and eggs, and we are in the South, maybe grits or... Uh, um, and stuff, and I had to pull a, a chair up to the stove to stand on top of the chair to be able to reach the burners and stuff when I was five years old. But, you know, my father treated me like an adult, and, and um, that's how I think we ought to treat students. I see more and more. We have, we have the Dean for Student Affairs office when I was a student, you know, just 50 years ago now, or almost 50 years ago, had like four people in it. It was a professor of mechanical engineering. Kit Wadley was the dean for student affairs. Well, last time I counted, or I didn't count, but I looked it up about 25 years ago, we had 37 people in the dean for student affairs. And it's not dean for student affairs, it's dean of student affairs. This was a major change they made, okay, uh, because they didn't want the students having affairs. <laughs> I mean, you know, <laughs> there's there are people who get paid to do these things, you know, to think of these things. Um, so I, I have sort of a negative attitude about this whole uh, evaluating students and treating students like their their kids. So they used to have, uh, well, in orientation week for freshmen, they used to, when I was a freshman, they basically put us in Crescent Auditorium and scared us to death. And then in the 1980s, they hired people and they would have these games out on, on the fields, okay, and it was supposed to be a, a team building exercise for the freshman class, right? Um, and they'd, they'd play tug of war, which I think was fine, uh, but they had these other little games with balloons and things like that, which um, I felt we were coming right out of kindergarten uh, and treating them like kindergartners. So uh, people have criticized me, faculty have criticized me for this course for not doing enough to make sure the students do the work. And I've told you, told you a couple of times now, maybe just at least once, um, that I don't care if you do the work. If you want to pay this kind of tuition and not get anything out of it, if, go ahead. You know, I mean, it's not, not my problem. Um, but anyway, and I actually have a tremendous faith in MIT students. You wouldn't have gotten here if you weren't overachievers anyway. So. Anyway, enough of that, um, I guess we are. So I talked about magnetic uh, materials. Um, we talked about hard magnetic materials briefly and how the tremendous increase in strength in different types of magnets. Um, and I'll pass this around. This, I pass the, the others around, but now we have some ceramic magnets. And we also have on here some neodymium iron boron magnets and you can feel the difference in the strength uh, of these uh, as they stack up. It's a lot easier to pull the ceramic magnets apart than it is the iron boron magnets so far as that goes. This is a piece of soft magnetic material. I talked about it. Uh, it's an amorphous metal foil. It's getting kind of old. It's rusty. This was made down in South Carolina and they can make this about six inches wide. Maybe they're up to a foot wide, but it's rapidly solidified. They basically squirt the metal out on a high-speed wheel, copper wheel. And if you squirt it properly, you'll make a foil. That's as thick as they can make it, and it solidifies at about a million degrees per second, or a million degrees Kelvin per second. And it is the world's softest magnetic material. You can't really tell by doing this, but it, it has 
low, lowest, lower magnetic losses than any other material. And it turns out the company that invented this, which used to be called Ally Signal, and now it's part of Honeywell, um, and they're the ones who built this $50 million plant. The plant was uh, commissioned by someone who's a graduate of this department, happened to be my house tutor when I was a freshman, but he was a material scientist. Um, turns out um, Honeywell or Allied Signal didn't get the patent on the most important property for this material. They were studying rapidly solidified metals back in the 1970s and they made some metal and they sent it to a guy named Professor Chad Graham at University of Pennsylvania and said, because uh, he was studying magnetic materials, he said, can you measure the magnetic permeability of this? They just were trying to dot their I's and cross their T's. He measured it and showed it was five times better, lower, softer magnetic material um, than anything else ever discovered. And since they didn't have a non-disclosure agreement with him, he owned the patent rights, and the University of Pennsylvania owned the patent rights to that material. So they had to buy them back, and it was a big, <coughs> a big fight and, and uh, things so far as that goes. Um, I should have looked at for Blisk on the web. Here's a, I did this morning, and the web's getting better and better. This is a nice graphic of a turbine disk that is not a blisk, and here's your root where the, the vein has to attach to this big heavy flange, um, and the root itself is, whereas over here in something where you can make the whole thing integral, which they do for 30,000 30, M250 engines of Rolls-Royce, uh, this thing is a lot lighter than this great big mass right here, as you can see, okay? So you'd like to do that because there's collateral weight savings. Um, I'll pass around, since we also talked about single crystal blades, I'll probably pass this around. I usually find some excuse to pass this around several times. This is a, I don't remember if this comes from an old Pratt & Whitney engine from like 1980s. It's uh, a disc from either, the engine goes on a 757 or a 767 engine, but hot section, single crystal blade, you'll see it has cooling ports on here. Uh, I probably can't see them there, that's why I'll pass it around. Um, but it has cooling ports, it, it's been filleted, they took a wire EDM and sliced it, it was a single crystal, but it has an internal structure, and it has, they cast these turbulators in here, and so this is, you're getting uh, cooling of the the hot gas is coming through, hot gas is being 1,000 degrees F, but this thing operating in an environment of 3,000 degrees Fahrenheit gas with a melting temperature of 2,400 degrees Fahrenheit, okay? And it has they, these um, holes in here are drilled at certain angles because they want the gas to come out to create this boundary layer effect of cooling on these. Blades today, this is a 30, 40 year old blade design but blades today are even fancier. They'd like to make them thinner and thinner. They're down to about seven to 10 thousandths wall. And the problem is, if your core that you're casting, you have a ceramic core inside this thing that you grow the single crystal very slowly, if it shifts by one or two thousandths of an inch, you've got junk, because you can't afford two thousandths of an inch out of seven thousandths. Okay, so you really can't get them any thinner than they're already making them. So they've gone about as far as they can with cooling. So that's Bliss technology. Um, does anybody know why uh, they want to keep going to higher and higher temperatures? You have any idea what the economics are of a 50 degree centigrade increase in operating temperature of the gas in the engine means about $2 billion a year fuel savings for the airlines around the world. Okay, so there's a lot of money to be made by getting higher temperatures. I mean, 50 degrees doesn't seem like that much, but people would kill for it. So, anyway, so we talked about there's collateral weight savings on a structure through use of lightweight materials. I talked about the blisk um, and how you could save 20 pounds on a disc. That could be 200 pounds on the engine because you got 10 discs. 
and the, the engines are out there hanging off these wings, and the wings can be lighter and whatnot. That's a general principle. I can remember <clears throat> going to Chrysler 25 years ago, and they were working on some new smaller vehicle, and they were going to make an all-aluminum version of this vehicle, and they had the same, or they had a 1.6 liter engine, um, and it turns out when they went to the lightweight aluminum, they didn't really get as good a bang for their buck on the uh, fuel savings because they were using an engine that was 1.6 liters. If they actually had a 1.2 liter engine for this small car, they could have gotten even more fuel savings. But you can't just go out and design a whole new engine just because you switched materials to get the best advantage of the material that you're, they were using. They were using aluminum for the sheet metal of the body. They were saving weight. They could have saved a lot more weight on the engine too. They actually, to get the full advantage of the material, you really have to design the whole thing from scratch and optimize the whole part. Uh, another example of that, since we've got some Boeing people here, does anybody know what the first part of a major aircraft is, first part you design? If you're starting your design, you design the landing gear first. Because the landing gear has to take the weight of the structure when it lands, and the whole rest of the structure has to be built around that to be able to transfer those loads from the rest of the structure to the landing gear when it lands. So if you talk to a designer at Boeing, they project, okay, we're gonna build a replacement for the 747, it's gonna weigh a half a million pounds, so we gotta have a landing gear that's going to support a half million pounds. And we're going to have to design structures like the keel beam. Everybody knows there's a keel beam on an aircraft. Just a great big eye beam goes front to back. And it's called a keel beam because it's a ship. Just like the ships we float in the water that have a keel beam, okay? The aircraft has a keel beam. And you build everything off that. And that keel beam has to support the loads that go that come from the landing gear when it lands. So a complex structure is a interaction between the materials and the, and the design. And you can't just go substituting one for another. I gave you, or I, I pointed out an article that I wrote for Technology Review back in 1995, um, 20 years ago now, um, on bringing new materials to market. And in there I talked about something I had learned through buying refrigerators, okay? When I was your age, the outside panel of a refrigerator was steel. And the inside panel was steel. And the, the shelves on the inside of the door were screwed into the sheet metal of the steel, and they worked just fine. And then in the mid 80s, I bought a new refrigerator and the outside was steel and the inside was a panel of plastic. And plastic is a much better material for the inside of a refrigerator because you're gonna spill foods on it. Uh, you know, it doesn't, it's got a low ener surface energy, much lower than metals and so things don't stick to it as easily. Uh, but within five years, I had to replace the refrigerator because they use screws to attach the shelves to the plastic. And plastic is a lousy material for threaded joints. You just shouldn't use threaded joints in plastics. Maybe for, maybe if you're talking Hasbro or, or uh, Fisher Price or something, some toy, okay, and your, your child's gonna come to you and say, Daddy or Mommy, you know, my toy broke, can you glue it together? And you say, of course not, I took Professor Eager's course on adhesives and we know that plastics have low surface energy and there is no good uh, uh, glue to make this, to fix your cheap little toy, child. Uh, well, maybe you won't say it exactly that way to them, but that's in fact the case. Most of these things you just throw away. Well, I had to throw away the refrigerator because the shelves were broken. By that time, by 1990, I bought a KitchenAid, which I think I still have, or at least I think I know it, who has it, still in use. 
they designed the plastic sheet metal, not sheet metal, but sheet plastic, so that the shelves basically slid into a slot like a drawer. Well, that's exactly the way you should join a shelf to a plastic wall, right? You design the wall so it has something that slips in, and you don't have these sharp stress concentrations of threaded joints. So the point was, you can't just substitute one material for another. Plastic is a better internal material for a refrigerator. But you can't just design it the same way you designed your, your steel one. Okay? And I was sort of irritated because I had to buy a new refrigerator after five years. But by the time I'd done that, people had learned and those refrigerators are lasting uh, longer than I want to have them. Uh, the outside is still steel steel for most refrigerators. Why? Because your children are going to run their tricycle into it. They're going to dent it. And steel is stiffer. It will take the, the tricycles much better than plastics, which would likely crack. Okay? Uh, and you'd be, be irritated when you have a cracked refrigerator and whatnot. So, um, you have to optimize your structure, uh, structural design with your material. And when you come get a better material, you can't just willy-nilly su uh, substitute it. Competition among materials, and we talked about food packaging. You got glass, you got composite, you got plastic, you got paper, you got metal. You name it. And as one of them gets better, the people refine the design of the other. And um, there's still a healthy competition, I guess it's healthy, among different materials. Okay. Any questions on that? In large industries. In small industries, uh, most people don't care that much. Uh, the schedule, by the way, um, I checked with Dr. Belmar, and I went all the way up to March 1st. If I do 12 lectures and he does eight, we will finish lectures on March 1st. And probably, uh, I'll probably give you a week break in between or something, and then we'll we'll try to schedule the uh, the presentations. How many people have a presentation already, sort of in the can or close to it? So, I mean, I don't want to start scheduling things, start putting too much pressure on you to get something done. But I mean, is that going to be a problem? You got kind of three weeks. That's I mean, not everyone's going to go that first week. Okay. In fact, unless I can, I'm still trying to see if I can get this room for multiple hours, not just eight, uh, nine to 10, but uh, nine to 11. And that way I could do six a day since there's 48 uh, students, that would still be a couple of weeks of presentations for me. Um, and again, I'm gonna ask you to keep track of the 20 presentations. You can include your own, that you attended your own, okay? Uh, but you're going to have 19 others on, on top of that, okay? And if you have any questions or if you want to talk about it, again, don't try to describe how to solve world hunger. Uh, I just got a, uh, a question about what was your question? What was your proposed thing you were thinking about just now? I can't remember. Uh, uh, natural fiber reinforced Okay, so natural fiber reinforced concrete. Lots of good issues there. Natural fiber tends to decompose, organic fibers tend to rot, uh, but we've been using them to make bricks since the days of Moses and before. Um, make, you know, can't make bricks without straw. Um, but what are the issues if we want to use it for concrete? Okay. And talking about uh, the issue of Roman concrete and why Roman concrete is better than any other concrete, I was pointing out, there's articles on that. I mean, I don't want you to come in and talk about all the different variations of concrete. It's a 2.2 uh, billion ton a year industry. There's actually a lot of technology there and you can't cover it in 10 slides. But if you wanted to talk about Roman concrete, there's some, and you're interested in Roman architecture or something, Roman concrete has lasted for 2,000 years and there's some good scientific articles of why it's so much better than the concrete we make today. So something more specific that gets down where you can be critical and and uh, learn something about the details of the material. Then leave it to me to talk about the, the generalities. So I was going to kind of use part of today as a little bit of a um, uh, recitation on competition with, 
uh, among, mater uh, among materials and say, okay, take something fairly simple and fairly basic that we've been doing for thousands of years, like how do you convey water? What was the first material that was probably used to convey water that you could think of? Their hand? Yeah, okay, they conveyed it up. That's good. That's probably earlier than I was thinking of. I was thinking of dirt, okay? So you, you have a stream over here, and you have a little hill coming down from, from the side of the stream, and you dig a ditch, and you let, let the water run down the ditch. You tend to lose a lot through the soil, but if you got a whole stream, who cares, okay? So if you, or you want to irrigate your, your field with water, you just kind of take a stick, and you hoe the ground, and make a ditch, and you use soil. What might have been the next thing? Because you're eroding away your ditch, what would you do to line your ditch? Rocks? Did someone say rocks? Yeah. Leaves? Yeah, you use leaves. That tends to be somewhat temporary because the leaves only last a season or two. But that's, that would work. Leaves, wood, okay? Uh, in fact, people have made wooden pipes or wooden troughs, so far as that goes. Um, and then they used stone, but then they invented mortar, okay, so far as that goes. And mortar in general, you take limestone, which is found everywhere in the world, because it basically is formed from the little sea animals that, that made, uh, took the calcium in the water and turned it into calcium carbonate, and then it precipitates out, and you make limestone or, or, or dolomite, which is, calcium carbonate and magnesium carbonate mixture. Um, and most of the calcium and magnesium is in the ocean anyway. Um, and oceans have covered most of the world over the last six billion years or whatever. So you can find limestone, limestone virtually anywhere, except in a place like Hawaii. Not a lot of limestone on something that just was built up out of the ocean floor with a volcanic ash. So, um, if they use cement in Hawaii, they have to import the cement from somewhere else that has limestone. But anyway, um, concrete aqueducts. The, the, the Romans used concrete. And then they started using something that's in, been in the paper recently in the past week. They started using a metal that has excellent corrosion resistance. Does anybody know what it is and why it's in the papers now? It's in the paper yesterday in the Boston Globe. You don't read the Globe? Okay, um, well, you know, depends on your political persuasion, but I don't particularly like the Globe's political persuasion. It's called lead, okay? Lead has excellent atmospheric corrosion resistance, um, and it's easy to form into a pipe. It's relatively abundant, and it wasn't too expensive. And so in the 1920s and the 1930s, when they were doing plumbing in houses, they had lead pipe. In fact, when I bought my house, which was built in, finished in 1938, it was built during the Depression, for, took about five or six years to build it, but there was a piece of lead pipe over the, the laundry sink, and I took it out, okay? Not, not that that piece, most of the, the rest of the lead pipe had been replaced, and it's typically copper pipe now, but um, apparently in Medford, Massachusetts, 47% of the homes have lead pipe for their service water, for the town piping. It won't corrode for hundreds of years, okay? But now we won't even let people use lead, lead tin solders on the copper pipes because the EPA, every town will send you with your water bill uh, an annual statement of how much lead and how much arsenic is in your water that you drink. And as we get more and more precise uh, in our ability to measure the amount of lead, the EPA requirements become lower and lower and lower because parents think that their children are stupid because they're drinking the local water. And I say, that's not the reason. It's genetic. Okay? It has nothing to do with the amount of lead in the water. Okay? But in some places, such as Trail, British Columbia, or Flint, Michigan, uh, some of the children do have developmental uh, cognitive problems because of drinking too much lead. Trail British Columbia, it's been a zinc smelting community for over a hundred years 
and there's lots of lead oxide in the air. And so children in Trail, British Columbia have been growing up breathing lead. Um, and they've done studies and show that they've had, got developmental uh, disabilities because of it. So lead pipe. Um, anybody, we have a whole building covered with lead here at MIT. Anybody know what it's called? It's called lead, lead sheet, but anyway. It's called Kresge Auditorium. Kresge Auditorium has got a surface of lead for corrosion resistance. Copper is too pricey. They use lead. Um, Kresge is a very, it's one of the architectural marvels of MIT, along with building, um, uh, building 13 and the Stratton Student Center. But Kresge Auditorium has a roof that has a thickness that is thinner than an eggshell in terms of the radius of curvature. Okay, it is incredible structure uh, from an architectural mechanical standpoint because it has this very thin uh, roof for the curvature of the roof. Um, and they put lead sheeting on it for corrosion resistance and it will last for a very long time. Anybody know what's unique about the Stratton Student Center? It's floating, okay? All of this was filled land, okay? This was, is the reason why they call it the Back Bay, okay? And there's a stone down there in, down in Boston that says it's 16 miles to Harvard. Everybody knows, not 16 miles to Harvard. It was when they put the stone there because you had to go around the Back Bay. And Beacon Street, anybody know why it's called Beacon Street in Boston? You know, right on the other side of the room. Because the Boston Common, everyone had a right to graze their cow, and you still do. You bring your cow to the Boston Common, and you can graze your cow in the Boston Common, and the police can't stop you, okay? It's in the law. That's where you graze your cow. That's where you got your milk. They didn't have refrigerators back in those days. And Beacon Street was a causeway across the Back Bay. Back Bay, Boston was a bay, and they didn't start build, uh, filling it in until the 1850s. And before that, Beacon Street was a one-lane causeway, and you had to carry a beacon on your cow when you went home at night or come over in the morning so that you wouldn't push someone else off into the bay. Okay? It was called Beacon Street or Beacon Causeway or whatever. But in any case, um, where was I going with that? Oh, MIT's built on filled land. Okay? It was just a little island here. Okay? And MIT wanted to move from Boston where they were over in the back bay on the filled land over there. And they wanted to move over here. And they had purchased a lot of the filled land that was over here. But there was one little island that had been owned by an alumnus of MIT, one of the first alumni. And this was around 1900. He had passed away and his widow would not sell the land to MIT. And they had all the other land they wanted, but they needed right in the center of this was this little island that he had owned and she owned. And um, finally, one day, she saw a beaver on that island. And she decided that was a sign that said she should sell it, sell the island to MIT so they could move over here to Cambridge. And she sold it, but on the condition that the main entrance on Mass Ave be 77 Mass Ave because her husband graduated in the class of 1877. So now you know. And when you have dinner tonight with one of your classmates, you can say, and why is it 77 Mass Ave? And I'll bet you they don't know. Okay? I don't remember the guy's name, but anyway. Uh, neither, neither does the beaver. Okay? Um, in any case, we had lots of ways to convey uh, water uh, pipe, lead pipe. Before World War II, and in some parts of the Midwest today, we use galvanized steel pipe to convey water. And you can do that in certain parts of the country, particularly where the water's hard. It means it has a lot of calcium in it because the galvanized zinc coated steel uh, has reasonably good corrosion resistance. In acidic waters, like we have on the East Coast, galvanized pipe will last for a couple of years before it starts rusting and everything, so we don't use it. And the uh, second half of the 20th century, after World War II, we started using not lead pipe on the East Coast, but we started using copper pipe. 
And we used copper pipe for many years. And now, what do we use? Anybody know what most new homes are they're putting in? Um, polyethylene, cross-link polyethylene, okay? PEX, this is PEX-A, cross-linked with an electron beam to cross-link it. There's PEX-B, which is chemically cross-linked. But we basically use plastic pipe. That's pretty stiff. This is a piece of PVC pipe, which is not anywhere near as stiff. Not the same diameter, but nonetheless, you can feel the difference in stiffness. But PEX tubing is very quick to install. It takes about half the labor as copper pipe. But even more importantly, nowadays, 10 years ago, this was no problem. Uh, but the offices over here that were redone for the student lounge in course three in my office uh, got moved for that. They basically used a crimp-on connector, a mechanical crimp-on with a rubber gasket. So it's copper to copper with a rubber gasket. And each one of those fittings cost like 30 or 40 bucks. Okay, I need to buy one sometime, but you can't get them at most hardware stores. These are plumbing supply houses that you got to go get buy one of these. I need to steal one from some construction site, I guess. Um, but they're not cheap, okay? But does anyone know why we've gone from soldering pipe to using this crimp-on connector, mechanical connector? Because too many plumbers burn down too many houses soldering pipes. And the law now says, in the last 10 years, you must have a fire watch, okay? In Boston, to help these are what, this is one of the externalities of material selection. Uh, they got rid of the lead tin solder in 1978 by legislation. And so they went to 95.5, which is 95 tin, 5% uh, antimony. Or is it? Some of it's got a little couple of percent silver in it for strength. And the plumbers hated it. When the plumbers would solder up something like a furnace in the base, someone's basement, with lead tin, they check it, and they might have one leak out of 100 joints that they had just soldered. They do it with 95.5, and they'll have 10 leaks, and they've got to go back and repair them. And if you repair 10 of them, you're going to have another leak out of one of the ones that leaked, or a couple more. So you've got to fill up the system. It takes forever to get rid of all the leaks. You can do it, obviously. But now the real reason that they use these compression fittings in most things is because you have to have a fire watch you got to pay a Boston policeman like 60 bucks an hour to stand there and watch you not burn down the house in the city of Boston. And in the city of Boston, it must be a Boston firefighter off duty. Okay? So he's making money. He's making better money than he makes as a fireman to watch you screw up the job plumbing uh, and not burning down the house. And if you do burn down, anyway, never mind. Um, um, copper and brass. We switched to PEX A and B. Um, we use cast iron, but cast iron pipe that we put in in the, in the old days in water um, has been switched to, we concrete line it because the concrete has better lifetime than the, the cast iron. The cast iron, after about 100 years, will start to decarbonize or graphitize, they call it, and it will lose its strength. And so, Turns out about 5% of all the water going through the streets of Boston is lost through leaks, okay? Um, there's leaks all over, and they got old concrete pipe, and every now and then a concrete pipe main will break, burst, and do $10 million worth of damage downtown um, and tie up traffic and everything. <clears throat> we got aging infrastructure. We used to use cast iron. Um, what would be the best material if cost were not an object? Probably gold. Okay, very corrosion resistant in water. But in fact, that's not what we use on critical applications. What the Navy is starting to use on nuclear submarines, where cost is an object, is they tend to start, they used to use regular steel pipe which would corrode away after about 25 years. The ship had a 30-year life, and you just, I remember one officer uh, was a uh, lieutenant junior, or an ensign, 
And when she graduated from the academy, her job on the ship was to fix the leaks on the 30-year-old ship. Because it's just full of leaks, okay? They put in carbon steel. But now they have to build 50-year sh ships, and they use titanium, okay? Very expensive, very lightweight. You can use almost no thickness of the titanium, and you can have excellent uh, uh, corrosion resistance forever. Um, Boeing's aircraft, I remember when the 747-400 came out, this was like probably 30 years ago, 25 or 30 years ago, I got a call from, I'd been over in the Far East for a couple of weeks, and I got, came back and I got an emergency call from Engelhard Metals. And they were making the platinum catalyst for the 747. And uh, anybody know why you have a catalyst in a 747? It's for the air you breathe. Okay, up there there's lots of ozone, and if you breathe those that much ozone for a trip all the way across the Pacific, you would have a very bad headache. Okay, ozone will give you a headache. So all the air coming into the cabin has to go through one of two catalysts, just like the type of catalyst that's on your car to get rid of the carbon monoxide. This gets rid of the ozone and converts it back to oxygen, so you don't get a headache on your flight. Plus, ozone's not good for your heart and other things, supposedly, medically. Um, and the 747-400 was an extended range. Each one of these different series of aircraft was trying to go further and further. And um, they were lightweighting it, and they had made stainless steel ducting pipe to carry the oxygen through the cabin. Uh, and they would switch to titanium just to get rid of the weight. Okay? Pretty expensive, but hey... You're talking on an aircraft, and you're talking about extended range, probably valued at more than $200 a pound, okay, to switch from uh, uh, stainless steel to titanium. And I get this call. Boeing had a ridiculous spec. They said that the pipe, they had a, Boeing has a lot of general specs. Most companies do, big companies do. And the general spec basically said, you had to make a, you had to make a weld. Uh, let's see, they had to make two welds. Oh yeah, they had to make two welds because you, you got this, uh, this. Uh, if you think of an anaconda, and it just ate. Okay, this is your catalytic converter in here, and you got to make a weld here, and you got to make a weld over here. So you got to make two welds to put the cat, the catalyst in here. That's what Engelhard was doing. They have to make a weld here, 360 degrees around. They have to make a weld over here. So they have to make two welds. And the welds on the general spec for welding of titanium, Boeing had a spec that had to be x-ray inspected and they could not have a flaw larger than 10 thousandths of an inch in diameter, about four human hairs in size. OK. You were not going to get Boeing to change the spec because Boeing has how many employees? 200,000. And who is the person at Boeing that could change that spec? There is no such person. Okay, It would be a committee and it would take three years. So Engelhard was having to weld these out on titanium. And they hadn't done a lot of titanium welding before. And they were getting a failure on 25% of their, I think 25 half their welds on the x-ray. They would find some little some little pore in there, okay? And if it was larger than 10 thousandths of an inch, they had to cut it out and re-weld it, and they only got one chance to re-weld it. You couldn't do two re-welds, okay? So the odds were you're going to have one failure, and then when you cut it out, the whole thing out, and try to weld again, the odds are you're going to have another failure. <laughs> so they had not been able to produce any of these um, any of these units for Boeing, and it was going to hold up the whole rollout of the aircraft. And people were getting very upset and very concerned. And so I said, well, how are you cleaning your titanium? Because titanium is very sensitive to any source of hydrocarbon, like your fingerprints. You sh when you're welding titanium, you should wear white gloves, just like a clean room. And, of course, they've been welding stainless steel. It's just like a welding shop. You know, the guy's hands are all greasy. His gloves are all greasy. Everything's greasy. And I said, um, uh, get, some, 
get some reagent grade acetone and degrease everything and because I didn't have time to go down to New Jersey and I said degrease it and then weld it and you won't get the porosity because the porosity comes from small amounts of hydrogen in titanium and I knew that anyway so I get a call again a week later well we tried what you said we still can't get it like, can you come down well it's gonna I had to be in New Jersey two days later for something else I said okay when I finish I'll come by it may not be till six o'clock that evening can someone wait for me so I go by and I walk through their shop and I look at everything I said did you get some reagent grade acetone no oh so I, I explained to them how to clean the titanium and get I said you got to get reagent grade acetone because regular acetone has got oils in it and when the acetone evaporates away it leaves oil you thought you cleaned it but it leaves oil on there and so they did what I said. They called up a week later and said, we're passing 100% now. I said, oh, great. So I sent them my little bill. And, uh, and then they called me up two weeks later and said, we're failing 25% of them again. I said, have you changed your clean? You know, well, no, we're doing the same thing. I said, go get some more reagent grade acetone and do a better job of cleaning and make sure everybody wears white gloves. And they eventually got out of the problem. <laughs> exact same thing happened up here at GE Lynn with electron beam welds and titanium. If you take my welding course, I'll probably tell that story in there. But um, so we even used titanium in some cases. That was conveying air. But uh, in, in ships now, we're using titanium to convey water. Gold would be the best, but it's a little pricey. Okay. Um, and I think I've probably spent enough. To, well, no, I, I might as well kill the whole day on alternatives. Conveying gas. Okay. We talked about conveying water. What about conveying gas? What have we traditionally, what, well, we didn't originally have gas because um, it's too difficult to, con to transport. Um, you can get gas coming, you can get swamp gas coming out of the swamps and you can see flames sometimes in some swamps uh, where the gas is coming up out of the ground. Um, and the first gas they had, they used to make coal gas. Anybody know what coal gas is? You take hot coals and you drip water on the hot coals. And the water reacts with the hot carbon. And carbon plus H2O gives you carbon monoxide plus hydrogen plus some CO2. When I was an undergraduate in my thermo class, we had to calculate the coal gas reaction all the time because it was a nice algebra example. It's a waste of time, but it's a nice algebra example. Um, to get the what's called the water gas or coal gas or sometimes called the water gas reaction. Uh, so you can take water and hot carbon and you can make carbon monoxide and hydrogen gas and people wanted that particularly as they got bigger cities in the 1800s um, because they could use it for street lights. Wow, okay. Except you had to pump, the, you had to pipe the gas to the street lights and the first material they used for the pipes to get the gas from the coal gas generator to the lights down the street was, anybody know? It was wood. They'd take logs and they would gun drill them out. What's a gun drill? Anybody know what a gun drill is? A gun drill is something where ordinarily if you had a lathe and you have, a, you have the drill, uh, you have the, the piece of wood that would spin and the drill would be stationary, okay? But in a gun drill, you basically spin the drill opposite to the direction you're spinning the, the, the wood or the metal. Uh, they call it a gun drill because that way you can get very, very straight holes. If you try to drill a piece of, if you draw, try to drill a long hole with a metal drill and a piece of metal like a gun barrel, it will always walk to one side, okay? And you won't get a hole more than 12 inches deep. But if you have both of them counter-rotating, okay? Now this is an important trick here. Can you counter-rotate? Most people will rotate in the same direction. I spent my senior year in high school doing this in class, okay? Because I was bored. And I can do figure eights in opposite directions. But anyway, it took, a, took me a year of practice. But anyway, um, if you gun drill, you can drill long holes. They would gun drill logs and bury them in the ground caulk them up with some mud or other stuff, or oakum or something, which is just grease, and they would run the, 
the pipe through there. I can remember going down, I wish I'd taken a picture of the wooden one, but in Boston when they're digging in the city, they will sometimes uncover these old wooden pipes, okay, that they use to convey the gas. Then they got to cast iron because it lasted longer than the wood, it didn't rot in the wet soil, and the cast iron can last for a hundred years. Then they went to steel. We still use steel. Black iron pipe, we call it. Black iron because it's got a magnetite FE304 uh, coating on the surface that's just as good as paint. Go down the basement of MIT, look and see the fire sprinkler system. It's all black iron pipe. Um, so we use steel. And then we got to, uh, in the 1980s, the Gas Research Institute spent a lot of money developing plastic pipe. It turns out gas pipe is supposed to be yellow so that when people are working on things, they know not to cut through the yellow pipe. It could be an explosion, okay? So this is actually a piece of polyethylene pipe. It's a distribution pipe. It's been welded together um, and it's got a yellow stripe on it to identify it as gas pipe. About the same time in Japan, they developed something called corrugated stainless steel tubing, and they, they put a plastic coating on it, but it's corrugated, okay? 10 thousandths of an inch thick stainless steel. This is great. You can, well, sort of great. Um, you can plumb a house uh, with this stuff in one day. If you're building a new home, you can put all the gas piping in all over with this stuff where it would take you three days with black iron pipe where you have to thread it, screw it together and everything. The labor savings are dramatic. You can buy this stuff in 150 foot coils, cut it very easily with the tubing cutter, um, put a uh, special $30 uh, brass fitting on it to make the connections and everything's wonderful. Uh, save a lot of money until you have a lightning storm. In a lightning storm, you'll have an arc, and the arc can perforate the polyethylene coating, which is good for 30,000 volts. Not a problem for the household current, because it's insulated. And so if you had a copper wire come in contact, it would have to defeat the insulation on the copper wire and have to dis defeat the insulation on this. The probability of that is very low. But in this case, and I'll pass this around, um, tomorrow. This one, you can have a little holiday. There's a little, a little teeny hole in the yellow coating. The yellow coating won't conduct electricity, but 30,000 volts is nothing compared to the millions of volts of a lightning volt. So it, lightning just, it's like the yellow tubing is not there. If the lightning strikes your structure, you'll blast a hole in the inside, 10 times the diameter of the little hole in the, in the, the stuff here and you will get, actually this was probably done with 110 volt with a little wire, but anyway. But you'll get it, uh, and it burns down about 100 homes a year. Okay, so um, the, uh, the companies um, deny it. Uh, actually they deny it and they admit it. Uh, the guy who first got all this stuff qualified, um, the father of corrugated stainless steel, he admits there's about 100 homes a year that fires are starting because of lightning, okay? Um, but they still fight it um, because for them, it's probably half a billion dollars a year of profit, okay? Uh, they sell it for five bucks a foot, whereas the black iron pipe you can buy for less than a dollar a foot and it saves you 60% of your labor, and in that sense, it's a wonderful product until the rains come and the lightning storm and your house burns down. Okay, I'll see you tomorrow, <laughs> and we'll actually get into